Valparaiso Baptist Church. Good morning, good morning. Another wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen, amen. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us to praise and worship you. I pray that you'd help us to, um, to forget the troubles of this world for a few moments as we focus solely on you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Would you stand and worship with us today? I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. In the lily of the valley, in him alone I see all I need to cleanse to make me fully whole. In sorrow, he's my comfort. In trouble, he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have offered him forsaken and all my idols torn from my heart. And now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, Tempts me sore, but through Jesus I will safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the brightest morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never ever leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith, I do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me. I've nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his present face, rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the brightest morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you guys are weak this morning, too. The 9 a.m. was like, the 9 a.m. was practically non-existent, but I know y'all could do better. Good morning. Hey, that's the energy I'm looking for. You know, I never got that energy out of the 9 a.m., so if you see any 9 a.m.ers, tell them they got to up their game, because they were like halfway dead this morning. <laughs> In fact... I even asked them, I said, how many of you are just too tired to say anything and like no hands went up? I'm like, how many are sleeping and that's why you're not saying anything, you know? <laughs> anyway, so anyway, we, we've got a great service in store this morning. We're really excited about what God's doing here at Valparaiso Baptist Church. We've got some special guests with, you, uh, with us today. Uh, some of you have probably already met them if you came for the small group hour. Uh, they are here representing Homes of Compassion and the Baptist Children's Home, so we're so excited to have them. I'm going to ask uh, Courtney to come up in just a moment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but before she comes up, real quickly, who remembers what's going on today right after service? Daytona 500. Not the Daytona 500. <laughs> it's even cooler than that, all right? Yeah, the talent show and the Valentine's lunch, right? So I hope that you've made plans to join us for that, and if you haven't, you're invited now. So now you have no excuse because you've been formally invited. But we have a, a great meal planned for you over there at the all-purpose building. Uh, the teens are putting that on. Um, it's going to be really exciting. The teens are putting that on because they are raising some funds for their youth room. There is no formal cost to come, but we do ask if you're able and if you're willing to make a donation to the youth group to help them offset their costs to uh, renovate their youth room downstairs. And so by all means, even if you didn't come prepared to give today, don't sweat it. There is no cost. They want you to come because it's the one time a year where the youth group can really come and serve you. They're going to serve all the tables and they're going to wait on you hand and foot. 
They're going to do anything you ask them to do. And you can tell them I said that earlier, you know, and go ahead and ask them something dumb and let their eyes get real big. And you can say, well, the pastor said that you'd do anything, but so no, but for real, come on out and join us for that. How many enjoyed the Super Bowl last week here at the church? You guys come out for that? Did you guys have fun? That was awesome. How many were excited the Chiefs won? All right. All right. How many didn't care? Okay. <laughs> that was the case in the 9 a.m. too. Everybody was like, I don't care. Well, you know. But listen, I've got family that live in like the Missouri, Arkansas area, and they were really rooting for the Chiefs, so I was really thrilled for my family. That worked out great. Uh, so praise God for that. But anyway, we're excited for this service this morning. Thank you so much for coming out. If you're here for the first time, we encourage you to fill out a guest card for us. You could do that by coming out those double doors and going to the left and go to our information desk. Uh, you can pick up a card there. Or if you're tech savvy, uh, scan the QR code right in front of you on the seat and you could let us know that you're visiting today that way as well. Here's why that's important. One, it's the best way for you to get to know us and for us to get to know you. And two, there's a free gift waiting for you at the information desk if you let somebody know that you filled out one of those cards. So please, we want to get you that first-time guest gift. Uh, it's a really nice coffee mug with all kinds of goodies on the inside of it, so you don't want to miss out on that. Make sure to do it. So with that said, I am going to uh, keep my mouth shut from here on out until I preach, but I am going to have Courtney come up and share about Homes of Compassion. Would you welcome her? social worker with Homes of Compassion. And with me in the back is Haley Rakovich, and she's also uh, my go-to, my friend, my co-worker, my s and she's also a social worker. Um, we have an office here in Valpo, but we work uh, to serve families from Lake County all the way to St. Joe. We are a ministry. We are trying to share the gospel to families in the area, but we also provide temporary child care while families are amidst a crisis situation. So the crisis may vary depending on the scenario, but we have a lot of families that may need um, recovery help, they may have a mental health crisis, maybe they don't want their kids to live in a shelter. We wanna come alongside them, especially when they have nobody, when they don't have support, when they don't have hope, when they don't have a church as wonderful like this. Um, we wanna come alongside them and provide that temporary childcare um, give them resources, food, clothing, um, and we just want to love on them while they're in our care. Our placements are from a weekend all the way up to six months. And you guys might be asking, why are we here? We are here looking for care families, volunteer families that are going to open up their homes to the children that we serve. We are looking for people to spread awareness to, um, you know, if you come alongside a mother, that you see alongside the street. And if you can just share that crisis card with her, um, that might give her some hope and encouragement. We are here even to look for some other volunteer opportunities or even to um, uh, get support financially. We are a fully funded ministry, but with more money, we're able to do more things. Um, so we would love to share with you guys more. Um, but we have a time crunch, so if you have any questions or concerns or anything, give us a call. We are open Monday through Friday, and we would love to chat with you um, if, if you have the time. Thank you. All righty. Would you stand and continue worshiping with us today? Trouble knocking at my door today. I ain't gonna let it in. Worry wanna steal my joy away. I ain't gonna let it win. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. And you're the reason why. I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed that God bears our feet. I know it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed that God bears heartbeat in my chest. No, it doesn't matter about the rest. If I got 
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever
When you made the decision to follow Christ, something inside of you woke up. Your soul was alive for the first time. The decision was very personal. That first spark of life was just between you and Jesus, but it couldn't stay hidden for long. God's presence has affected every part of your life, bringing light to even the darkest places. And now, it's time to let it show. Baptism is your opportunity to shine brightly before your friends, your family, the world. It's time to say, I've buried my old life. My new life has begun. Baptism is a declaration. It's a line in the sand. It's time to let God's light shine for everyone to see. All right. Well, good morning. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there with me. Romans chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help this morning as we open up the scriptures together. Let's pray. Lord, it's so good to be here in your house this morning to worship you, to honor you. Lord, we pray that you'd help us today as we explore a little bit more about what baptism is. Why, why baptism? What, how is that significant? Why is it important? So Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts, minds, and our ears to listen this morning, and that Father, you would just uh, send your Holy Spirit to give us understanding. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if we were to just be real for a moment, there's a lot of beliefs out there concerning baptism. Um, if you were to go to various different churches or faith backgrounds, you'd probably find 
all different kinds of teachings about baptism. So my goal today is to talk about why do we as Baptists believe baptism is for the believer and by immersion. Um, so we're going to have three baptisms in this service. We had two in the last one. We'll have three for this service. And why do we go up into that tank? Why do we do what we do? And so that's the question that we're going to answer this morning and study a little bit more in depth. And so my hope is today, no matter where you're at on this or what your experience was in the past on baptism, hopefully we can at least agree on this. Today we come and understand that the scripture is our authority on what baptism is. That's what we're going to hopefully come into agreement on this morning. And so my hope is, is to make a compelling argument as to why do we believe in baptism by immersion and for the believer. And so if you're here today and you've understood baptism to be something else, I'm not here to, to slight your opinion or to say that you've had a less than baptism, but my hope is, is just to bring the scriptures to you and make a compelling case and let you decide that for yourself. So with that said, we're going to start in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 11 this morning. So I'm going to assume that you're turned there with me. So here we go. <clears throat> it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even, to, or even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now, a lot of people use this passage as reference to explicitly water baptism, but I don't think that's actually the case here. Here, Paul is not necessarily giving... Uh, a thesis, if you will, on water baptism, but rather he's talking about what happens in salvation. He's spelling out in detail what our faith in Christ has done for us. But even though this passage is about salvation, it actually shows us why baptism by immersion is the perfect picture of what Christ has done on our behalf. It literally pictures perfectly what happens the moment that somebody is saved the moment that somebody accepts Christ into their life. And so let's just kind of look at this together, okay? As we create this argument, first of all, it's the perfect picture of what Christ has already done for us. Why is that? Well, Paul says in the passage that we were baptized into Christ Jesus and we were baptized into his death. Now, those are kind of peculiar phrases, aren't they? Verse 3 says, don't you all know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? So, first of all, as you look at this baptized into Christ Jesus, what does that mean? Well, it means that we were baptized into his body. In other words, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, what immediately happens is you become a part of the family of God, Amen. right? As soon as you place your faith in him, you are now a child of God. He's adopted you as a son. He's brought you in. And so that's a concept that's taught all throughout the scriptures. If you were to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, picking up in um, uh, verse 13. Actually, we'll pick up in verse 12. It says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members that, uh, of one body being many, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one spirit. So the first thing that baptism by immersion does is it gives the believer a chance to proclaim, hey, I'm a part of the family of God. I've, I've been grafted into this family. And it's a public statement to the church and to the world 
that you have made the decision to follow Christ. You've been baptized into the body of Christ. And so first and foremost, baptism is a public declaration. You're declaring to the church, I am part of the family of God. I have placed my faith in him, and I am giving this as a testimony to everybody that that's what I've done. But it goes on. So not only are we baptized into Christ uh, or into his body, but we were also baptized into his death, right? Look at verse 3 again. It says, do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, we're also baptized into his death? Now, I have to confess, when I first read this passage, I thought, what in the world does it mean to be baptized into his death? Because it's just a, a little bit of an odd phrase, isn't it, to say that you were baptized into Christ's death? But oftentimes in the Bible, when you read something that seems a little peculiar and you don't really understand what it means, if you just keep reading, more than likely the passage will continue to expound on the thought. And that's exactly what happens here. If you go down to verses 6 and 7, you'll see that uh, Paul gives us a description of what it means to be baptized into his death. In verse 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So Paul is saying, hey, you were baptized into Christ's death, basically meaning that the moment that you were saved, there's a part of you that passes away. Your old self is passing away. It's no longer you. You're becoming a new person in Christ, right? The former life that you were once enslaved to, the sin that once held you captive, Paul says, no, you have, you have buried that with Christ. Just as, as Christ was crucified, you have put that sin to death. And so think about that. All the sin that used to control us, all the mistakes that we made, all the things that haunted us in the past, it no longer has control over us, right? It has been defeated. And so on the cross, Jesus quite literally took all of our shortcomings, all of our mistakes, all of our sin, and what did he do? He nailed it to the cross. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, what were those famous three words that he shouted out? It is finished. It is finished. And so when you think about that, theologically, what we're saying is, is baptism is a picture of putting your old self to death. It's no longer who you are. You're no longer controlled by the passions that you once followed. And because of Christ's sacrifice, we can now live in this reality of having new life in Jesus Christ. We now have victory over our sin rather than defeat. And so that's why the passage goes on to say in verse 8 that if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, right? If we've died with him, then surely we're going to join him in his resurrection. We're going to live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead and dies no more. So death no longer has dominion over him. So praise God, when we're saved, not only do we put our old self to death, but we get raised to walk in a newness of life, right? The Bible calls us a new creation when we follow Christ. Sin is no longer our master. We no longer have to do its bidding. The shackles have come off. And so now we have found the freedom that is found in Christ. That's why when we hear testimonies about people that have placed their faith in, in Jesus, they talk about the change that took place. And I would imagine that a great many of you that are here today, if you admit to following Christ and you've placed your faith in him, I would imagine the testimony of so many here today would be, hey, I'm no longer the person I used to be. Because of the Holy Spirit transforming my life, I'm no longer the person that I used to be when I first came to know Christ. Because Jesus changes everything. And so, here's the thing. So if this passage has nothing to do with baptism by immersion, it's talking about our salvation, then why even mention this passage? Well, because baptism is symbolic of everything that Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 6. Think about this. As somebody steps up into the waters of baptism, and you're going to see this at the end of service today, you're going to have three people that will step into the baptistry with me, and God bless them, it's going to be like the chilly Jordan because it's cold. The, the heater broke down last night, so go figure. Uh, but I experienced, I experienced it with them earlier, and I'll tell you what, now I know how Jeff Wingard feels when he baptized down there in Tennessee. 
you walk in in the water and it like takes your breath away? Well, it's cold. So anyway, but all that to say, when you see them walk into the baptistry, there's actually something that's going on there. Think about that. They, they come in and they stand before the whole church. Well, what is that? They're publicly identifying as a part of the family of God. They're making a testimony. Hey, I am now a child of God. I am adopted by him. I am a part of his family, and I want to share this testimony with the world. Baptism is a public profession of your faith. But then in addition to that, you have this idea of being baptized into his death. Well, what's going on there? When they get dipped down into the water, what happens is, is it's symbolic of putting your old self to death. It's almost like you're putting something in the grave when somebody gets dipped down into that water. So you're putting your old self to death, but then what happens? We lift them up out of the water. Well, what do you all think that symbolizes? New life, life, right? The resurrection. Just as Jesus, you know, was put to death, three days later, he raised to life. Hallelujah, right? He raised to life. And so it's, it's portraying that symbol. I've put my old self to death, but now, by God's grace, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer living as I used to live. So that's the number one reason why we baptize by immersion. That's the first reason that we'll give today. And so if that's not enough of a case for why we baptize by immersion, let me share with you a couple other good reasons, okay? First of all, when we're baptized by immersion, we are following in Christ's example. So take a look at this. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Uh, If you'd like to turn there, you can, but I know it's just a couple verses, so you could just hear it if you'd like. But it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. So notice, he was in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice from heaven came down and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So think about this. Here I think it's clear that Jesus himself was baptized by immersion. First of all, it said that he was in the Jordan. So he wasn't baptized by the Jordan or around the Jordan. He was in the Jordan. I mean, they actually walked down into the Jordan, okay? So the passage indicates that they were clearly in a body of water. But even above above and beyond that, Notice that the passage says nothing about how water was poured over or sprinkled over or anything like that, but rather it says that coming up out of the water, right? You see that language that's in there? They came up out of the water. And so the moment that Jesus came up out of that water, well, what does the passage indicate? God was pleased with what Christ had just done. You have a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down and descended to rest upon Christ, right? So literally God was pleased with the act that had just happened. So Jesus himself was in the Jordan and he came up out of the water. So if that wasn't compelling enough to just follow the example of Christ, quite possibly the strongest case for baptism by immersion has got to be this. If you were to search all of the scriptures, all of the scriptures throughout the entire New Testament, every baptism ever detailed in scripture was a baptism by immersion. We never see any example of anything else. One of the most compelling stories that tells this would have been in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we meet a man named Philip. He was a guy who was out there doing the Lord's will. Uh, Wherever God told him to go, he would go, he would preach, and he would minister to the people. Well, God came to him one day and compelled him that he needed to go to meet this man from Ethiopia who was sitting in a chariot. So he goes and he walks along the road and he finds this man. And there he meets this man who's reading the scriptures. He's reading the scriptures and he didn't quite understand what he was reading. And so in Acts chapter 8, picking up in verse 30, we see this. It says, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? So he asked Philip to come up and sit with him, and the place in the scripture that he read was this. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. 
In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So then the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask, of whom does this prophet say this, himself or some other man? So Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. This is cool. He preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from getting baptized? So Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch, here's that phrase again, they went down into the water. You see that? They went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, notice similar phrase to Jesus' baptism, they went down into the Jordan, went down into the water, then they came up out of the water, the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So here's what we know. When Philip first approached this man from Ethiopia, we could assume he wasn't a believer. He didn't really understand what he was reading, let alone, you know, he didn't believe in the Messiah, let alone that Jesus was the Savior of the world. So Philip saw this opportunity to witness to the man. He comes up to the chariot, and he's reading in the prophet Isaiah, and as he's reading from Isaiah... Isaiah was a messianic prophecy. He's reading the very passage that is forecasting Jesus' future coming. And so he, he, he takes the opportunity to say, okay, well, let me start with this first and let me tell you about how Jesus was like that lamb that was led to the slaughter. And he, he goes on to share how Jesus was that perfect sacrifice for our sin, right? It literally says he preached Jesus to him. Man, that's pretty cool, right? Churches don't need to do much else but preach Jesus to people, right? I mean, that's pretty powerful in and of itself. So he preaches Jesus to him, and eventually we get the indication that he understood what was finally going on. You know, Philip is preaching. There's a moment where this man obviously is believing what's going on, and now the next logical step in his mind is he wants to get baptized. And so notice, though, when he wants to get baptized, what, what all happened? In verse 38, 38, it says, He commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Then when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. So, once again, identical to Jesus' baptism. Jesus went down into the Jordan. The eunuch went down into the water. Jesus came up out of the water. This Ethiopian man came up out of the water. So are you noticing the trend here? As you look at this, it all follows the exact same mechanism every time, literally to a T. So if baptism is by immersion, the bigger question we have to ask is, well, then who gets baptized? If we know that baptism needs to be by immersion in some sort of body of water and you literally have the symbol of going down into the water and coming back out, well, then who gets baptized? Well, notice... The passage answered the question for us. In verse 35, it says, When Philip opened his mouth, beginning with this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. They went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And in verse 37, it says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, here's a man who was eager to get baptized, right? And as we should be. Right? The moment that we place our faith in Christ, the very next step of obedience ought to be getting baptized. Because in the Great Commission, what did Jesus teach us? He said, go make disciples doing what? Good. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them all that he observed. Right? So literally, the very next step that Jesus says in the process of becoming a disciple, he said, go make disciples baptizing them. So it's the very first thing that we ought to want to do once we follow Christ. Once we make that decision, we follow in baptism. So there was one question, though, that Philip had for the man. He said, okay, if you want to get baptized, you know, what, what prevents you from getting baptized? Have you placed your faith in Christ? Have you believed it with all your heart? And the, the Ethiopian man said, yes, I have. Yes, I have. So I would say the only qualification for baptism is, have you placed your faith in Christ? If you've placed your faith in Christ, you're a great candidate for baptism. 
And I would suspect that maybe there's some people here today that you've placed your faith in Christ, but you've never been baptized in the way that scriptures teach. You've never followed in believers' baptism by immersion. Okay, here's, here's the formula if you want to have a clever way to remember this. Baptism by immersion comes after conversion. Okay, it's a simple way to remember it. Baptism by immersion comes after conversion. If you're here today and you've placed your faith in Christ and you've never been baptized, I would ask you, why the delay? Why the delay? There should be an eagerness to want to follow in baptism. Why? Because it's an it's a exciting opportunity to tell everybody what has happened in your life. You stand before the church as a public testimony saying, hey, I am a child of God. I've been redeemed by Christ. I'm part of his family. Then not only are you proclaiming that you're a part of the family of God, but you, when you get dipped down, you're telling the gospel story. You're telling everybody, my old person has been put to death and I'm being raised to walk in a newness of life. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Literally, your baptism tells the gospel to everybody that's present. When we have these baptism services today, just watch how the gospel is proclaimed visually through baptism. It's so cool. And so I encourage you, if you're here today and you've never been biblically baptized, talk to me. Come and talk to me about it and say, you know, pastor, I've never been baptized. I've never had that moment where I've stepped in that water and I went down into the water and came back up expressing newness of life. And if you're here today and you've not been biblically baptized, come talk to me because I'll tell you what, we will fill that tank again in a heartbeat and hopefully with a heater that works next time. <laughs> but we will fill that tank in a heartbeat. Here's what I always say. There's very few bills at the church that I'm excited to pay if they go up, but a water bill is one that I don't mind. That bill can go up as much as it would like to. You know why? Because it means that we're filling that baptistry, and that's exciting, you know? A um, couple years ago, we had a number of baptisms here at the church. Praise God for it. And literally, the water bill had gotten so high here at the church that the city called and said, hey, is there something wrong with your water meter? Your water bill has gone up. And, you know, I got to say, praise God, we're baptizing people. <laughs> it was awesome. I got to tell the city that's why the water bill went up. It was so cool. So I would love for that to happen again, you know. Praise God. Let's fill that baptistry. So if you're here today and you've never made that decision, you make sure to talk to me, and we'll talk about baptism, what it means. We'll reiterate everything we talked about this morning, and we will pencil that in and get that on the calendar. That would be an exciting day. So with that said, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're going to have a baptism service just in a moment. But before we do, let's have a time of invitation where you can respond. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we've taken the time to learn very clearly what baptism is, Lord, we're grateful for what the scriptures teach about it. Lord, the baptism like nothing else is a proclamation of the church of what God has done in the life of a believer. And so, Lord, we're, we're grateful for that. And, Lord, we're so thankful that we have three in this service today that we can celebrate with who have said, I have made the decision to follow Christ, and he has changed me, and I want to live for him the rest of my days. I'm so thankful for those decisions that were made. I pray, Lord, that these baptisms would be a powerful proclamation to the church of the goodness of God in their life. And so, Father, if there's anyone here today that hasn't had that opportunity to proclaim to the church their faith in Christ through baptism. I pray that maybe today would be the day that they pull me aside and say, Pastor, I've never been baptized biblically, and I'd like to have a conversation about it. And so, Father, we love you. If there's any other burdens on the hearts of people here today, I pray that they'd feel the freedom to come and pray at the altar. This time is just between them and you. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. At this time, the altar is open if you need to pray this morning. This time is just between you and the Lord.
Amen. All right, you may be seated. Uh, if you just give us a moment, we're going to get ready for the baptism. In the meantime, Rick is going to sing a song that he's prepared to kind of help transition us. And so just uh, sit tight, relax, and uh, pray for the poor souls going into that cold water. So, <laughs> all right.
All right. So real quickly, before I call, I think Stefan's going to come first, right? Before I call Stefan down, uh, as we mentioned, uh, look for the gospel in this baptism. What you're going to see is uh, all three of the people that are going to get baptized today, you're going to see them dip down into the water. What did we say that represents? The old self passing away, right? Then as they come up out of the water, what does that symbolize? New life, new life. New life. So let this be a declaration to the church of the goodness of God in our lives. This is the gospel. We're no longer who we used to be, and we're walking in newness of life. It's an exciting thing. And so it's a celebration when we have a baptism. So when, uh, when you see the person come up out of that water, feel free to get excited about it, because it's a really exciting day in the life of a believer. So with that said, I'm going to ask Mr. Stefan, my buddy, to come on down here. Just careful down those steps. And it is cold, isn't it? I feel you, buddy. <laughs> it is really cold, isn't it? Woo. All right. Come on over here, buddy. <laughs> Good job. All right, turn around for me. All right. This is Stefan. He has placed his faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you that right now. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then I'm going to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, cross your arms for me. Okay, we'll make it quick and painless. Ready? All right, here we go. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! All right, buddy. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> That is cold, I'll tell you, poor guy. <laughs> All right, Kiera, come on in. Is it as cold as we warned you about? <laughs> A little bit? <laughs> All right, this is Kiera. Can I get you to turn around for me? Kiera, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Stefan. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I get you to step up just a little bit for me? All right, you ready? Here we go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What an exciting day. Five baptisms today. Um, we're going to have Lily come in here in just a second, if she's ready. Lily's ready. Come on in. They survived, so you can survive, girl. <laughs> All right. Come on in, Lily. It is really cold. <laughs> is that freezing? <laughs> you all right? <laughs> it's so cold. All right. Lily, I'm going to ask you the same question that I just asked those two. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Cross your arms for me. You ready? And here we go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's exciting.